What if Tesla wasn't first? What if wireless power began at Giza, beneath a golden capstone, tuned to Earth's own song, right here in the desert outside Cairo, on a late September morning? If you've ever wished energy were clean, cheap, and everywhere, stay with me. Today, we'll follow a trail through stone, sound, chemistry, and money to ask a wild question with real stakes. Was the Great Pyramid a machine? Let's open it, carefully, together. A royal tomb should tell stories. This one refuses. No hieroglyphs, no funerary art, no caches of treasure, no mummy. For a structure raised to honor a god king, the interior feels strangely functional. Narrow shafts point like needles. Chambers sit in precise volumes. Corridors shape and squeeze the air. If not a ceremony, then what? The question begins with form. Form follows function, even in stone. And here, the function appears as flow, resonance, and control. Precision shouts from every edge. The base is leveled within fractions of an inch across 13 acres of blocks. The sides target true north with a finesse most modern builders would envy. From the air, the four faces conceal a secret. Each is slightly concave, so the monument actually has eight faces, a detail that becomes visible only under equinox light. These choices are not accidents. They read like calibration marks. Scale the monument's height and base by a curious factor, and you land near the planet's own measures. At minimum, the geometry shows an obsession with the Earth itself. Materials whisper the next clue. Local limestone rises in reddish tiers, strong and common. But the original outer shell, now mostly gone, was smooth white Tura limestone, an excellent electrical insulator, low in magnesium, built to block stray current and hold charge inside. The interior tells a different story. Granite packed with quartz lines, passages, and chambers. Quartz under pressure makes a charge. Squeeze it, tap it, shake it, and polarize faces. Watches keep time with that trick. Piezoelectricity turns mechanical stress into voltage, and voltage into usable work. In the pyramid, granite sits exactly where compression and vibration would be strongest. That is not poetic, that is design. Sound is the bridge. Step into the grand gallery and clap. The space answers. Measurements suggest a strong response around 440 hertz. Concert A to some, F sharp to others in a shifting drone. The king's chamber replies with its own deep tone. Above it, stacked granite beams lie rough on top and smooth below, as if artisans tuned them by shaving mass until the note rang true. Change a cavity's volume and you change its pitch. That's the bottle whistle, the Helmholtz idea. Imagine chambers and shafts as a linked instrument that can pump energy when struck by the right frequency. Chemistry loads the instrument with fuel. Traces of hydrochloric acid appear in one narrow shaft. In another, residues of zinc compounds and ammonium salts linger. Feed streams from different shafts into a central space, and hydrogen forms cleanly. Flood the horizontal passage. Let it rise into the grand gallery. Pressure climbs. Granite compresses. The air ionizes and grows more conductive. Along the gallery ran pairs of resonators, according to several reconstructions, anchored in grooves and set at intervals. They would drive standing waves that organize hydrogen into obedient patterns. Stone hums. Charge migrates. The system wakes. Skeptics asked for physics, not poetry. Fair. In recent years, modeling work suggested that at specific radio wavelengths, fields concentrate inside the pyramid and beneath it, as if resonance gathers power rather than letting it leak. Separate research on vibrating granite found electrons migrating toward surfaces under sustained vibration, 
a slow electric wind through stone. Neither study proves a generator. Together, they sketch plausibility. Resonance can focus fields. Vibration can herd charges. Stone can join a circuit if we invite it. How would energy leave the stone? Think antenna, not wire. Tesla sighted his Wardenclyffe Tower over an aquifer and drove metal down to water, hoping to couple Earth and the ionosphere. The pyramid sits over aquifers too. Copper paths and iron remnants have been reported in its depths. Picture a conductive spine from groundwater up through granite, guided by insulating faces, pulled to a gilded apex. If the capstone were gold, the best natural conductor, concentrated fields would chase it. The sky becomes the final wire. Power turns from a line into a field. Something failed. Hard. In the grand gallery, scorch marks freckle the ceiling where resonators may have stood. In the king's chamber, cracks split beams. Walls pushed outward by more than an inch show the memory of overpressure. The great step outside the chamber looks battered, as if a hot tide slammed it. One shaft wore a rind of salt a finger thick, the kind of crust you'd expect if hot gas boiled upwards and cooled. Add the chemistry back in. Mix ammonium chloride with sulfuric acid, and you don't just get a reaction, you get a violent one. A controlled detonation could pump the system. An uncontrolled one could silence it forever. How old is this story? The orthodox timeline says four and a half millennia. Pharaoh Khufu. End of tale. Yet stellar patterns fit the Orion Belt more cleanly, many thousands of years earlier. The Sphinx shows deep water wear in a land that has been deserted throughout remembered history, suggesting furious rain long before dynasties. Climate records describe turbulence at the end of the Younger Dryas, a whip-crack shift when ice retreated and seas surged. Some studies point to a colossal solar outburst that overwhelmed the magnetosphere. Lightning on a planetary scale could vitrify stone and scorch circuits. If a power plant lived then, it faced a sky on fire. Why should any of this matter to you? Because energy is the first domino. When power is cheap and clean, clinics hum and fridges run in villages, teachers teach under lights, pumps lift sickness out of kitchens, and a kid with a laptop starts a business that never needs a smokestack. Cheap energy reshapes a life. It reshapes a nation. If a safer, saner grid hides in an ancient lesson, we should listen without pride and test without fear. Tesla understood both promise and peril. He lit fields of bulbs without wires to make the idea feel real, then aimed to flood the world with broadcast power. He raised a tower, asked for support, and met a wall built from mines, rails, meters, poles, wires, and profit. Free power kills toll booths. Funding vanished. The tower fell to scrap. Innovation is never only equations. It is incentives. Ideas that reduce scarcity collide with people who profit from scarcity, and those collisions leave dents. To be fair, markets also scale miracles. They judge risk. They choose winners, but incumbents protect what feeds them, and a grid without rent threatens rent. The healthy path sits between hype and denial. Build a sandbox. Run small, safe tests. Publish failures and wins. Share data, not slogans. Invite the toughest critics to poke holes. Pay them to try. If the story is wrong, we learn. If the numbers rise above the noise, we learn something better. What would a real test look like now? Not a pyramid, a room. Granite walls form a known resonant cavity, a controllable hydrogen stream with interlocks and inert backups. Acoustic drivers sweep around 440 hertz to map nodes and antinodes, probes on the stone to track charge migration, field sensors above and below, thermal cameras to watch hotspots, non-sparking hardware, vents, and independent oversight. Then repetition. Then a second lab. 
then blind runs. Either the signal appears and survives scrutiny, or the idea retires with grace. Skepticism belongs at the center of the table. Ask what would falsify the claim. No charge migration under resonance? No field focusing on target wavelengths? No repeatable output above losses? Close the book. Ask also what would move a skeptic. Pre-registered protocols. Third-party labs. Tight error bars. Raw data open to anyone patient enough to tear at it. The goal is not to win a comment war. The goal is to answer a question decisively. Picture a turning point. A small granite rig hums. Sensors lift. The room goes still. Then the methods and code go online. Not a miracle. Not a secret. A result. Perhaps modest at first. Enough to say, try this in your lab. Enough to turn a meme into a method. Enough to bring new eyes and better hands. The pyramid stops being a battleground and becomes a teacher. The lesson is not that the ancients were wizards. It's that physics is patient, and sometimes history leaves us notes. So, was the Great Pyramid a machine? The honest answer is that it could have been, and that we can find out. Its form favors resonance and flow. Its materials support stress to charge conversion. Its scars look like the memory of an operation pushed too far. Its setting invites the sky into the circuit. The rest is on us. We can measure. We can replicate. We can be generous with data and ruthless with error. If it fails, we keep our humility. If it works, we keep the light. To conclude, carry this out of the desert with you today. The Great Pyramid does not behave like a typical tomb, and its design choices make functional sense in a resonance framework. Quartz-rich granite under acoustic stress can migrate charge, and tuned cavities can concentrate fields, enough to justify careful, open experiments. The interior damage fits a story of heat and overpressure, not quiet ritual alone. Tesla's wireless dream collided with incentives, not only equations. If we want answers, we must test with courage and share with honesty. If this sparked your curiosity, add your critique, propose a better setup, and demand replication. Let's trade rumors for results and noise for numbers. Clean energy is not a myth. It's a measurement we have the power to make. Together, now.